Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's policy session of the Phoenix City Council for Tuesday, February 27th, 2018. We'll call this meeting to order. We do have a quorum present. I'll now turn it to members of my city council, our city council, to see if there's any information and or follow-up requests for the community or our staff. Councilman Williams, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, last Friday morning was the District 1 monthly breakfast, and Lieutenant Colonel Williams from Luke Air Force Base was there, uh, gave us all the statistics, and reminded us that Luke has been there, this is her 77th year. And uh, more importantly, March 17th and 18th will be the Luke Air Force Air Show, and everybody is invited, and the Blue Angels will be there this year. Uh, also, the Duet, which is a great volunteer organization, is having their ribbon cutting. They are opening an office at Metro Center, and they provide free vital services to seniors. And they have 42,000 hours of volunteer services to 800 homebound adults, thus saving $10.6 million to taxpayers. And so if you need more information, you can call my office and we can tell you exactly where they're located and how to contact them. And then for lunch today, uh, Councilwoman Gallego and Valenzuela uh, and I were guests, I guess, at the uh, uh, Sky Harbor event that uh, Welcome Condor. Condor is going to start their flight in May, and they will be flying direct from Phoenix to Frankfurt. We have worked on this a long, long time, and it's very exciting. And I am very glad to see the billboards going up and more advertising going out. And the Condor representatives were quite charming and really eager to start the service. So it was really a great lunch. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. Other members of the Council? Councilwoman Gallego, please. Agree with Councilwoman Williams. It has been a great time period for Sky Harbor. We're sending, we have the great flight to Frankfurt and uh, Mayor just helped kick off the flight to Montreal. So everyone needs to go on vacation. Bonjour. Or work trips, economic development. We had a great event this Saturday in South Phoenix, our first ever Taste of South Phoenix at the Croc Center, sponsored by Mary Kay Homes, where we got to enjoy the wonderful restaurants, including farm fresh ingredients from South Phoenix and a fun zone from the Girl Scouts. I'm hoping it will become a great annual event that highlights the wonderful food that we have to offer on the South Side. Um, today was also a great day for District 8 and its nonprofits. Uh, New Pathways for Youth, one of our partners on the city's My Brother's Keeper initiative for young people, had their big annual event today and some very moving stories about how much mentoring helps, for, helps young people. And then in our city's constant war on vacant lands, we had a big groundbreaking this morning in the Garfield neighborhood where Trellis is building affordable homes. They are walking distance from our downtown, so a great option for people who love what we have in our downtown and, and need an affordable option and Trellis will continue to do housing counseling to make sure that home ownership is sustainable. So if you know anyone who wants to be a downtown resident in one of the hottest neighborhoods in the city, please check out those great houses in Garfield. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. Other members of the council, Councilman DeCicio, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, this re uh, revolves around the conversations I've had earlier today and the meetings I've had regarding requests for proposals, RFPs, as they've been commonly known. If we could either take this to a subcommittee or take it to a, a full council for policy, I found out today that uh, there can be changes made to these requests for proposals after the council's voted on them. And the concern that I've got on that is that the proposers, the individuals that are proposing for this, can actually work to make this work to their benefit. So I would, my personal opinion is I'd like to see no changes made unless they go directly to the council for approval so that it goes through a proper vetting process in a public process. The problem is these, the, those, the changes that are made, whether they're substantive or not, I think it's a lot of it is subjective, is the fact that it doesn't go through a transparency public policy procedure. 
and we saw this occur with one of our cases today, and it became controversial, not just because of that, because of other things, but I'd like to see those issues, my preference is that they, all changes just basically come back to the council, and whether it just even goes to a subcommittee for change or whether it goes to the full council, some other procedure or policy put in place so that it becomes publicly known that others get to know that there have been changes made to the thing. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you very much uh, for that suggestion. Uh, we'll figure out which subcommittee, but it, maybe it would be a good idea to have a, just a, the discussion through the whole RFP process, uh, including those issues. Council Waring, please. Uh, so I think everybody's aware we won our case with the FAA. Uh, there were three public meetings, I think, last week or two weeks ago. Um, with the FAA, I know mean, no, not everybody got to attend. You know, we tried to spread them out throughout the city. I know people from my area went to, to meetings in other parts of the city because that was the available date for them. But I did feel it was appropriate to have uh, Jim Bennett and his staff from the airport come out and brief, at least the folks in my district, although obviously everybody's welcome. Um, so we're gonna do that on March 28th. It's a Wednesday night at the Paradise Valley Community Center, which is, uh, I'm sure most people are familiar, but if you're not, uh, it's 40th Street and Bell. It's on the west side north of Paradise Valley High School. I just thought it might be a good thing. Obviously, those, those were really big events. We had the most in our district. I think about 250 people went to our FAA event. So even though there was tons of staffers there, I want to make sure everybody got their questions answered and understand what's going on and understand the timeline and so forth. And I thought our airport folks were the right people to do it. And also, you can ask other questions about what's going on with Terminal 2 and, and so forth. But but really, uh, I also hope it, it maybe uh, provides a little bit of closure on this unfortunate episode that started in, uh, in September or October of 2014. On another note, I did have a request of staff. Uh, I guess this would be probably for Milton or maybe Brad. I am curious what happens if our officers are falsely accused of malfeasance. You know, what, uh, what happens? What's the sanction? How do those things get resolved? I'm just curious how often are people found to blame for that? There have been a lot of things said about the behavior of different officers. Frankly, at these council meetings, individual officers have been, their names have been thrown out, which I don't necessarily really feel is appropriate. We, we asked for it by putting our names on signs and getting elected and so forth. I think um, the average sergeant or something, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily fair, but I'm just kind of curious. I'm not saying any specific instance was a false accusation in any way, but I'm just kind of curious, how does that work? So sometime whenever you think it's appropriate in the future. All right, we just have a briefing with uh, Council Waring about uh, uh, opportunities for officers to uh, clear their name, if you will, if they've been falsely accused of uh, inappropriate actions. Thanks for that uh, question. Any other comments by members of the council? Councilman Alkowski, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Last week, um, Vice Mayor Pastor and myself, we traveled out to Tijuana, Mexico to uh, meet with some tech businesses. And, and our whole goal was to actually bring businesses to Phoenix. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone that was a part of that. Um, that mission and um, good news is that they want to come out in September and actually start looking at different sites out here. So we'd like to invite you, Mayor, to, to kind of be the host of that and help us um, bring those um, businesses to the city of Phoenix. Also, um, I'm not sure if um, Kate Gallego already mentioned it, but that Central City South is hosting a free community fair on Saturday, March 3rd from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mark um, Matthew Henson Park on 8th Avenue between um, Sherman and Tonto. Um, they're gonna be having health um, screenings and arts and crafts and food, music and all kinds of vendor booths out there. So come on down, bring the whole family, enjoy the community fair. Also, um, it was a great um, a great celebration we had in South Phoenix. The mayor and um, Mrs. Gallegos and myself were out there and we opened up the um, South Central Light Rail Com Community Office. What a great opportunity for individuals from South Phoenix if they have any concerns or if they have any dreams or they want to look into the future and kind of tell us what the future of South Central with the new light rail going down. It's a great place to sit down and, and come up with these, those dreams and at the same time learn about the past and, 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 and create history um, for South Phoenix. So thank you for all those individuals that were a part of that team and making that happen. And I think it's a great project, and I think we should start doing more of those while we start to extend the um, light rail in the future. Um, we, we have the um, McDowell Mountain Music Festival back in District 7 again. That's at Margaret Hans Park. That's March 2nd through the 4th. 
For more information about the lineup, tickets, food vendors, you can visit their website. It's www.m3ffest. And 100%, what's so great about this festival, 100% of the um, proceeds all go back to um, nonprofits within our community. So I just really want to thank the um, coordinators of the festival and for giving back to the community. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Councilman. Councilman Valenzuela, please. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, we, we are now enjoying spring training baseball, which is incredibly exciting. We're all having a good time. Hopefully everyone has an opportunity to go take in a game. Uh, you know, it's always fun to see who's going to throw the first pitch. Sometimes the neighborhood leader. Many times you see the mayor perfect, throw a perfect strike. Every time. Every time. <laughs> There, there are no cameras, but trust me, every single time. No, but it's always, it's always a good time. And, and just a reminder uh, about what is going to take place there in Maryville with that spring training baseball stadium. Uh, the Brewers released the renderings. It, it's, you know, they're going to invest nearly $60 million of private funds in renovating that stadium. Uh, there is an additional partnership there with Grand Canyon University to bring in a tutoring program uh, for, for kids. It's, it's just going to be a great uh, project that's going to invite more private investment, and, uh, and I'm incredibly excited about that. Uh, this past weekend, we had, or we finished up Phoenix Startup Week, and uh, it, it ended with a, uh, you know, on an a incredibly high note with the street pitch uh, last uh, meeting policy meeting and during the announcements I talked about Phoenix's version of uh, the Shark Tank. Well, uh, the street pitch, uh, there, were, there were 10 startups that pitched a couple of investors and uh, there, were, there were three people total. There were two investors and uh, Phoenix's own Misty Hyman, Olympic gold medal swimmer from the uh, Sydney Olympics. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a tough comp uh, competition. Uh, I, along with so many others, enjoyed it. Again, 10 competitors, and the winner is BK Fields, CEO and founder of ElderSense. Uh, now, ElderSense is a Phoenix-based startup that helps families find options for senior living arrangements. And Ms. Fields won $75,000 total, $50,000 from the Arizona's Founders Fund and $25,000 from uh, Michael Houle's Houle Ventures. So congratulations to all of those who pitched, all of those Phoenix entrepreneurs. Uh, we are all uh, obviously incredibly proud of our entrepreneurs and congratulations to PK Fields. Uh, lastly, on March 10th, we'll have another Code Phoenix Day of Code. This will be at the Brett Tarver Learning Center located at 1516 North 35th Avenue. It will be from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, the last one was was a blast. We had uh, kids coming in from uh, throughout the entire city of Phoenix to come and, and learn how to code. Uh, it's been incredibly uh, popular. There have been a lot of other things. So we bring the kids out, they learn how to code, but there's also a lot of things they can do just to stay active. Uh, they're able to play games out in the, uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, it's obviously at a school, so We'll take them out into the field, and, and, and they can uh, also just stay active, and, and uh, you know, we serve them lunch. So it's always a great time. Uh, you can find that on the website, on the City of Phoenix website. You can just search code PHX. But again, this is on March 10th between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. at the Tarver Learning Center, located at 1516 North 35th Avenue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. I want to say thank you for your leadership with, with the Brewers. Did sign, I think, a 30-year-long 30 a 30 year long lease, so they'll be there for at least that long in the Maryville uh, neighborhood. It's such a point of pride for uh, uh, Maryville, and they were close to uh, leaving, and uh, it took a lot of creativity, a uh, new way of thinking about how to do an appropriate agreement between a city and a, and a major league organization like the uh, Brewers, but it got it done, and uh, it's going to be for the betterment of Maryville and all of the city of Phoenix that the Brewers will be playing spring training baseball. Uh, in Maryville for decades to come. Vice Mayor, did you have any comments or uh, uh, questions, follow-up requests? I do. Please. Um, there are several things happening within District 4. Uh, Tis the season to street fairs. 
Uh, this weekend, uh, Melrose on 7th Avenue Street Fair is March 3rd, and it's their 16th Avenue um, Fair, and it's from 11 to 5. Uh, we have the Windsor Square Home Tour and Street Fair, and that is Sunday, March 11th from 11 to 4. And we also have Sunday Off Central Block Party. It's uh, from it's March 11th from 10 to 3, and that's the Midtown Neighborhood's Annual Resident Block Party on Vernon Street. In addition, uh, we will be doing Friends of Encanto Tree Dedication. Uh, our friends at TGent have planned 70 red plush, plush, plush uh, uh, trees at Encanto Park to honor the 75th birthday of Dr. Daniel Von Hoff, and he's the TGent physician in chief, distinguished professor, and executive vice president. Uh, I'll be hosting a celebration recognizing the generous donation at 11 a.m., and all are invited. So uh, please come and see the trees, and uh, we're pro promoting walkability and shade and protecting our environment. And finally, I accepted the Mobile Lights Connected City Award on behalf of Phoenix in recognition of the city's work to facilitate connectivity and wireless infrastructure investment. And so we received an award for that, and uh, we'll be sharing it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Any other uh, comments, follow-up requests from members of the council? I now turn it to our uh, acting vice mayor to see if there is a, a call for an executive session. And there is. Mayor, in accordance with a properly posted notice and agenda, I move that the City Council, pursuant to Arizona Revised Statutes, Section 38-431.02a, meet in executive session on Wednesday, March 7th, 2018, at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room, 12th floor of Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street, Phoenix, Arizona, and on Wednesday, March 20th, 2018, at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room, 12th floor of Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street. Street, Phoenix, Arizona. There's a motion. Is there a second? There's second. a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? That passes unanimously. Mr. City Manager, is there any reports or budget updates today? Mayor, we have a budget item later in the agenda, so we'll defer to your first uh, policy item. All right. Our first item uh, is our uh, legislative uh, update. It normally goes at the end. This team has to wait through the entire meeting. We want them to get through it so they get down to the legislature as quick as possible. Ms. Peters, you want to introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor uh, and members of the council. Uh, indeed, the legislature is very busy in the last week or two. Uh, today with me are Government Relations Director Frank McCune, uh, John Wayne Gonzalez, and Clark Princell from his staff to provide today's legislative update. And we'll dive right into it with John Wayne. There we go. Uh, Mayor and council members, good afternoon. Um, today is the 45th day of the <clears throat> of the regular um, uh, session. Uh, more than 1,280 bills, or I should say 1,280 bills have been introduced to date. Um, and again, going back to December's uh, guiding principles uh, on which the government relations team uh, works under, um, you have uh, opposing unfunded mandates, preserving local control, protecting revenues, and of course, most also important is protecting our water resources. And with that in your report, as we have done in the past, uh, your report has uh, items that the uh, that staff has been working against because it meets under one of those core principles, uh, letters A through K in your report. Um, and with that, if uh, are there any questions on any of the bills located in A through K? Any questions about bills on A through K? Mayor? Please, Councilman. Just a couple, one. I would think we would want to support uh, HB 2330. Uh, it just deals with, it's ba you know, when they talk about giplets, basically a corporate giveaway. It's, you know, corporate giveaways is what it is. And it just requires the city, if the city wants to give away tax dollars, that they're responsible for it and it keeps and it, uh, other entities, it holds them harmless. But the one bill, um, other than the one dealing with the housing that I think Councilwoman Stark and I and others have been working on, is HB 2479. I can't figure out why we're opposed to that. With the same issue that came up several years ago that dealt with this. And if we don't look toward a type of uniformity statewide, we're never going to be able to tax these items. Remember, 
the business community is completely supportive of this, but it's looking for this, the same rules across the board. And if you're looking for internet taxation or something like that, I would hope that we would rethink that one. In particular that, I mean, there are other ones I have issues with and I'll vote on you know, my conscience today on them. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments on A through K? If not, there's, oh, is there a motion? Oh, and Mayor, oh, whatever motion is, I'll just tell you the ones I'd like to have excluded from there. Um, a, B, E, F, G, I, J, K. Okay, so could we get a motion on the other items ex except the ones that Councilman DeCicio asked to be excluded? Move approval of items C, D, and H. There's a motion and a second. Any additional comments or questions? Roll call. Councilman DeCicio. No. This Cal is your guesses. Oh, pardon me? These were the three you liked. No, the three I liked. Yes, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> you are so nice to I'm me. I'm trying to I think it was the Chinese here. thing that we were at last night. Thank you. Yes. You're right. <laughs> Councilwoman Gallego. Yes. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Stark. Councilman Valenzuela. Yes. Councilman Waring. Councilwoman Williams. Yes. Vice Mayor Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, yes. Uh, so that item passes unanimously. Uh, maybe we take the items that Councilman DeCicio wanted to pull out. Um, and do an omnibus on those items. I assume you want to vote no on those items. Correct, okay. right, Mayor. Okay, so we can do an omnibus on the remaining items. Wonderful. And I did not, in my first motion, include the sober living one because we're going to hear about that separately. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, move approval of items A, B, E, F, G, I, J, K. Second. There's a motion and a second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Uh, the motion passes with one no vote. Okay, please move forward. And uh, Mayor and Council, the only thing oh, left in please. your report would be letter L. Um, and that bill is dealing with uh, sober living home certification. Um, an update for the Mayor and Council, uh, this bill um, left the House uh, with amendments that the city had been working on uh, in co cooperation with the Phoenix residents and with the stakeholders from the, uh, the sober living home industry that have been par participating here at the city on the task force. Um, there was another meeting yesterday um, that had the involvement of everyone I just mentioned with Senator Brophy McGee and uh, Representative Campbell uh, to try in the Department of Health Services to try to uh, land on language that works for everyone. And uh, it appears now that the, the House bill and the Senate bill, will, uh, amendments will be going on those bills to make sure that Phoenix still has the ability, or I should say any city um, has the ability to adopt their own licensing scheme uh, under sober living until the state of Arizona adopts their own rules at the Department of Health Services, and then they would take over from that point forward. Um, and we made sure with the residents, with uh, Take Action Phoenix and some other folks in the room, made sure that there are opportunities for the residents whether it be at the city level or at the state level, that they still have avenues to address any complaints in their neighborhoods. And that would be the update and staff would recommend to support the bill. All right, Councilwoman Stark. Mayor, thank you. Um, I've had an opportunity to be a part of those meetings and I wanna thank everyone that's been involved. If you recall, at the league meeting last August, we did ask for this to uh, go to the legislature and I'm very happy because it passed the House unanimously both parties, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and I wanna thank the neighborhoods who have been involved and staff, and I think we might actually have some language passed and actually have some legislation to help us as a city and to help all of Arizona. So thank you, everybody. That's, and I'd be happy to make a motion if I can. Can I do that, Kate? Okay. <laughs> you're on I the like council. It. You're eligible to make as, a motion. Um, you agree I, to join our government relations team because I think we got something going on there. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of work. Um, I, I make a motion to support it. Second. There's a motion and a second. Ms. Barker, did you want to provide testimony on this item? This is a potential state legislation as it relates to sober living homes. 
just make a blanket statement about the government relations you that may. is going may I sir please okay thank you mayor and council Diane Barker district 7 I support the city government relations going into the legislature at the beginning of the opening of uh, the Arizona legislature I saw some of your faces there and uh, being a person from the public we want all of government to be working for us I say as I use mass transit, you know, I want not this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction to say we're just this. When I get a ticket, I want it to be comprehensive and to be integrative, okay? So that's my, uh, I support the government relations and I wanna say that we share some of the big revenues with the Phoenix Convention Center, with the state, I want to see the downtown get revved up with more revenue, and I was out in force last night. I'm gonna pass these out. I said, do you know what time it is? Does anybody care? And the people in the line for Chicago loved it. I said, come down Wednesdays. We walk and run, fit Phoenix, and I got some high fives, and so I wanna see you too. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Barker. All right, so there's a motion and a second. Councilman DeCicio, please. I also want to thank Deb Stark for all the work she put into this thing. I mean, matter of fact, we're talking about going down to the legislature and other issues now, too. So she's great to work with. She's amazing to work with, quite frankly. And then I also want to thank Sam Stone in my office. Just a quick story on that. First day that we had the first meeting on this, the neighborhood meeting, was also Sam's first day on the job, but he came so completely prepared to that meeting and help guide that thing, it was just amazing. Uh, Sam, thanks for all this, and all the neighborhood leaders that were involved in it. I think that we need to summarize exactly what's occurring in our community, and that happened in California and started making its wave our way here, and how Phoenix, in particular Phoenix, and then the state of Arizona is literally leading the charge on this. They're called sober living homes, and we all want to make sure we're compassionate to these individuals that have addictive problems. That's an important thing to realize that these people can be victims as well. And so what's happened is they become profit centers too for some entities, not the, the good responsible ones, but for the ones that are there just to make a profit. They didn't care. They had no attendance on site. They had multiple calls from our police, from our fire department, where they were just immediately sent over to the hospital. So what this does is it puts in place a model for us to be able to protect our neighborhoods and at the same time be compassionate to those individuals that have these problems. Um, it was a, it's a strong balance, it's a good balance, I believe. Uh, but at the end of the day, to have something that's bipartisan is amazing. I mean, I think this is one of the few bills that have passed the legislature this year so far that are bipartisan and have complete support on that. And I think it's because of all the hard work that was put into this thing. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? All right, we have a motion in favor of city supporting 2529. There is a second. All in favor? Mayor, oh, Councilman, please. Well, no, no I, think, I think there's a lot of comments being made. I do want to point to our government affairs team. This was, this was hard. This was really difficult as we worked through this with the neighborhood leaders, uh, with legislators, uh, with the League of Cities and Towns. And there were just so many entities all the, the staff briefings that uh, coming from, from my office and Deb's office and Sal's office and, and I'm sure keeping the mayor's office and everyone else abreast of, of, of what was happening here. Uh, this, was, this was really difficult, but this is an example of why we have a government affairs team here in Phoenix. And I uh, just wanna congratulate uh, all of you who are doing this job for us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for those nice comments. Okay, there's a motion, there's a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. It passes unanimously. And uh, that's, that's it for our report, uh, Mayor. Thank you very much. Hurry up and get back to the legislature. All right, next on the agenda is item number two. Item number two is the five-year general fund uh, forecast. This is the uh, third part, I guess, of a, of a three-part uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, story to tell this Describe council it. and the community about where we are budget-wise. This is our longer outlook. Um, so I guess I'll hand it over to city manager who will uh, say a few words and hand it over to our budget research director, Jeff Barton. Mr. Zerker. Thank you, Mayor. As uh, you mentioned, this is the five-year forecast. 
which is a part of our three-part extravaganza of the last month, where we've talked about just our time horizon. A budget is a one-year horizon. A five-year forecast, or a forecast is a horizon you lay out. We laid out a five-year forecast uh, as a best practice, and we've been doing this since the downturn back in 2010, I believe Jeff told me. And last, two weeks ago, we talked about the pension liability, which is a much farther uh, horizon. And so today, we want to we want to look at that five-year forecast. It's very brief, but it really is the culmination of a year uh, worth of effort by the city council and then the staff on your behalf because a year ago we had a completely different picture and over the last 12 months you've addressed this and our staff have followed that to address this uh, issue and so I'm going to turn it over to our budget and research director Jeff Barton who along with his team who are here uh, have done great work with all of our departments and so with that I'll turn it over to Jeff Barton. Good afternoon mayor members of the council as Ed mentioned today we're going to speak to you about our five-year forecast this forecast is just a one component of our multifaceted uh, budget process, our very transparent budget process. I'd also like to highlight that our budget process and our budget, we've received um, numerous awards over the years. The GFOA Distinguished Budget Award we've received since 1989, and the ICMA Certificate of Excellence Performance Management we've received almost every year since it, it's been in existence. So as Ed mentioned, the five-year forecast is a financial best practice. It is a strategic planning tool that we use to help guide us to make decisions to protect those vital city services that our residents have come to depend on. And so what we're gonna do today is walk you through um, the recipe or the, the secret to the, the budget. So again, it's, it's very simple, very basic. Resources, less expenditures, provide either a surplus or a deficit as we look ahead. For us, our resources include everything from our taxes, which include city sales tax, state shared revenues, VLT, which is our vehicle license tax, income taxes, and things of that nature. Also includes fees and charges that the general fund receives for services rendered by general fund. Also includes interest on cash pool that sits in interest-bearing accounts, as well as transfers from non-general fund entities, such as the enterprise funds, paying for their fair share of general fund services. An example of that would be aviation paying for its fair share of human resources department. And finally, it includes our fund balance, which also includes our contingency. So that's the carryover fund balance that we have at the end of every year, as well as our contingency fund. On the expenditure side, um, largely our expenditures consist of personal services, so that's our employee costs. When you net out uh, internal department charges and transfers, employee costs represent roughly 80% of the city general fund budget. Um, beyond that, we've got our services that we provide to our residents, our capital equipment and repair for repairing our facilities, vehicles, and things of that nature, as well as contracts that we engage in with third-party contractors to provide services to our residents, as well as providing services to the city. And finally, our commodities for things such as office supplies, computers, and, and, and et cetera. So when you add all that up, you either end up with a surplus, and if you have a surplus, that means you have the resources to provide new or expanded programs and services. If you have a deficit, that means that reductions to existing programs and services are required or net new revenue is needed to bring in to balance the budget. And again, I'd just like to remind everyone that by state statute and city charter, we are required to adopt a balanced budget, and we've done that every year. So as we look ahead into the future our, for our, for our five-year forecast, it's largely dependent upon the health of the economy, inflation, and known increases. So as we look at our five-year forecast, the first thing I want to walk you through are a couple of our general fund revenue assumptions. Number one, first and foremost, the five-year forecast does not reflect any future fee increases or decreases, and it does not include any new sources of revenue. Um, for the purposes of annual growth, the rates that we're using here range from 1.6% to 4.4%. And again, we continue to meet with and consult with the University of Arizona and participate in the state forecasting project. And we continue to rely on the econometric model that we've built in consultation with that group. Uh, also, this is also a best practice that's not unique to us, but when you're developing a five-year forecast, we do not try to model a recession. Um, we'd be wrong if we tried because we wouldn't know when it was going to hit nor the depths of how bad that recession would be. So no recession is reflected in this five-year forecast. Next, we continue to follow the council's policy of maximizing the primary property tax rate. And again, we are assuming for the purpose of this forecast, no negative impact to state shared revenue, either via legislative action or the census impact that we discussed briefly with you during the last presentation that we had. 
So when you look at our five-year forecast, the upper and lower ranges that you see, they increase slightly as you go further out away from the baseline forecast. That represents the economic volatility of the forecast. Um, this slide really highlights for you a couple of things that I want to always bring to our attention as we develop our budget, and it, just our revenue watch list. These are things that are not unique to this year. They're unique to just the process in general, things that we constantly keep our eye on. Number one, I've, all, I've often mentioned to you the importance of our holiday sales tax collections. We just actually got that information in a few days ago, so my staff is currently still reviewing it. But it's incredibly important for us to have strong holiday sales because it's the, it's the baseline from which we develop this year's estimates for revenue as well as our baseline for next year and the years beyond. And so we'll be bringing that information back to you in the trial budget um, status report. And then secondly, state shared revenue as a whole, that's always something that we keep our eye on because of pending legislation, but also as we discussed last month with you, the impact of the, the uh, upcoming census, that could have an impact on our overall state share collections. So it's imperative that the city of Phoenix takes an active role in, pr in promoting the census, and it's important that our residents take an active role in participating in the census to make sure that we're accurately counted. The second area that I'll bring up to you regarding state shared revenue is just something that we're watching. Um, as you know, the state, through the tax simplification um, model, they are now collecting all taxes for cities and towns. One of the things that we are challenged with from, my, from our perspective in budget and research is we're seeing some slight timing issues. We're not saying that we're not getting our fair share, but what we're seeing are timing issues in terms of when that information is reported to us. So it's really becoming more and more difficult for us to compare a period last year to a period this year, just because there may be some timing issues in those overall collections. We'll continue to keep our eye on it, and if we see any issues, we'll bring that back to your attention um, as, as soon as possible. And finally, VLT, vehicle license tax. I've talked to you a little bit about this last month. Um, vehicle license tax are up significantly from years past. Primarily because, as you know, during the recession, people held on to their cars for a really long time. There were a lot of 10, 11, 12-year-old year old cars on the road. Coupled with technology enhancements, people were able to hold on to cars longer. We're actually seeing significant increases in VLT collections this year, and we think that's going to continue for a little while. But eventually, it will settle out. So that's something that we'll keep our eye on. And then two other areas that we, just to bring to your attention, we know historically have had some volatility. Ambulance billing fee, especially now, not knowing where the Universal Health Care Act is going to land, there could be some impact to ambulance billing collections. And municipal court revenue, that's one of those things that historically, as the economy has ebbed and flowed, so too have those collections. So we'll just continue to keep our eye on those things moving ahead. On the expenditure side, Operating expenditure growth is based on our historical growth rates, which fall within a range of CPI and, and just historical spending of 1% to 2.5%. Uh, pension costs are based on the latest actuarial models for both COPERS and PSPRS. And for PSPRS, the five-year forecast continues to reflect a 25-year amortization period. Our compensation costs are based on the current contracts that end on June 30th of 2019, so one more fiscal year. The negotiations for the upcoming contracts will start in December of this calendar year. So for fiscal year 1920 and beyond, those contracts will be subject to future negotiations. So for the purpose of our forecast, we've assumed a status quo. That's what we've done in the past to ensure that we don't violate any type of bargaining issue. And, fi and finally, our contingency fund, um, we continue to keep this at 4%. However, it is growing by $2 million a year. And this is consistent with the council policy to grow that contingency. And by the end of our forecast period, we will be approaching approximately $60 million in our contingency. And that's significantly up over what it was in 07, 08. I believe it was roughly $24 million. So it's almost three times what it was back just a few years ago. And again, just like our, our revenue, the upper and lower ranges of our forecast, they get wider and wider as you go further out from our baseline forecast. Oh, jumping ahead. So again, as we talked last month for next fiscal year, instead of looking at a, project, a projected shortfall of 43 to $64 million, we're looking at a balanced budget. Now, I will say that my staff and staff and departments, we are still scrubbing expenditure data for the current year and base year, as well as our revenue. So it's possible that there could be a little bit of a surplus at the end of this that we'll bring back to you in a couple of weeks. As we look ahead to the other years, to Ed's point, I'll just fast forward through these really quick. If you remember last year's forecast, primarily our baseline or the midpoint in all of these years was, was a deficit for a lot of these years. 
This is showing marked improvement over that. And a lot of this is the hard work and the direction that you provide to us as city staff. But each one of these years, if you look at the midpoint, is a balanced budget. And, and that is considerable improvement over where we've been over the past few years. Um, if you have any questions about that, we can, we can ask, answer those at the end of the presentation. And then finally, we'll come back, as the city manager said, in three weeks with the city manager's trial budget and the preliminary CIP. Then in the month of April, we have our community budget hearings. And then May, we have the proposed budget, the manager's proposed budget and council budget decision. And then June and July, we have our normal and customary legal adoption process. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barton. Um, Mr. Manager, anything else before we hand it over? Okay, now I'll hand, this is for information item only for the benefit of the members of the council and the public. So now I'll turn it over to the council members for any questions or comments that they may have. Uh, Councilman Waring, oh, I should note there's a couple uh, cards in this item as well, but we'll, Councilman Waring, you go first. Uh, it is better, you know, we, we talked about this in my office than it had been in the past. If you could go back and read uh, the one slide. Sure. So I'm curious, I didn't think to ask it before. So in 2021, 2022, there's no, looks like to your mind, obviously it's a few years out, no possibility of a deficit. Why is it different than 2020? in 2021 and then 2022 and 2023. What's the? In terms of the difference? Yeah, what's? Really, it, it, like I mentioned to you earlier, the further and further out you go, you see those ranges just grow. So a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're really uncertain about how much revenue is gonna grow versus how much we think the expenditures are gonna grow. Then the other piece of it you see is, again, we're hope, we, we are hopeful that we start to see some of the impact of those pension reform measures that, that you have been very active in. So you start to see some of the flattening out on the COPER side of the pension. But again, it's, it's really just the overall revenue growth that we start to see going forward relative to the expenditure growth. So it seems like if I look at this, it seems like, you know, particularly in 2021, 2022, when there's no red, but I guess I'm just curious you're not really anticipating deficits if all things are equal. That is correct. Now, stock market's way down today. You know, who knows what could happen. That is but, correct. But that's definitely different. Obviously, I don't have the other charts from previous years in front of me, but it's definitely a better situation than we were anticipating three, four, five years ago. That's correct. I recall pretty dramatically, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Thank you. Sure. Hopefully, you're right. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Stark, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, maybe... We can go back to the revenue, um, or uh, rather, yeah, revenue assumptions. So sure. I just got my property valuation yesterday. My property went up 20000 which is good. But how does that translate to the city's? I suspect if mine's going up, it's probably going up everywhere in the city. That's correct. Okay, so how would that translate? So if you if you look at the if you look at the attachment that's included in in your council report, there's a very detailed level of expenditure and revenue forecast in there, and you see that our revenue estimates for property tax we can see, we continue to see growth even though we're saying that we're not growing the rate. So as your property values increase, so too the, do the city's collections increase. Now again, we're capped by state legislation in terms of how much that growth can be. And again, we know that you have been very adamant about seeing that property tax rate come back down at some point in the future. So we're also mindful of that. But from a primary standpoint, just remember the primary portion of the property tax is what pays operating. The secondary portion is what pays for the debt service on our, our outstanding bonds. Okay, thank you. I just wanted you to put that on the record in front of the audience. Sure. Did you hear that, Mark? <laughs> okay, thank you. Councilman Williams, please. Uh, I've read recently where the governor is hiring more auditors because of the lack of uh, the income from the sales tax. Is there any indication that's impacting us? since yeah, they collect it all? That, that's one of those things that I, that I mentioned earlier. For us right now, we're seeing some timing issues. I can't necessarily say definitively to you that we're having collections issues. When I compare what was collected this year versus the same time period last year, it's difficult for us to compare because when we were collecting things for ourselves, we knew exactly what we were looking at. 
Now the state's giving us information and we don't have all of the detail that we used to have. And so we're working with finance and finance is working with the state to improve some of that record keeping, if you will, so that we know exactly what it is that we're looking at. So we're gonna continue watching it. And like I mentioned, if, if we start to see any trend of us thinking that there's slippage in what used to be our revenue and it's going elsewhere, we'll bring that back to you and we'll actually address it um, through the proper channels. How, how much is the delay? It really depends. I mean, we'll see one month will be up, next month is down. Then we see mid-month mid adjustments. So it, it's really difficult to say. The other thing that it, it, there are certain things that look questionable to us. Typically state and city revenue, they follow the same logical trend. There are certain categories within the sales tax collections that aren't following the same trend. For example, telecom is positive for the state, maybe negative for us. It just, it looks odd. So we're starting to dig into that a little bit more. Again, we're just, you know, a little over a year into TPT reform. So it's gonna take us a little while to really figure out what it, what's really happening. And in addition, Councilman Williams, to your point, generally speaking, more state auditors ensuring that uh, people are paying the taxes that they rightfully owe is going to end up proportionally with the city because we share in state revenue. So in the big picture, it's a positive to, for the state to add auditors, I think, in terms of knowing how much it's gonna get into Phoenix uh, businesses or taxpayers. We, I don't think we have that level of detail from them, but on general perspective, it's a positive. All right, I'll now turn to a member of the public who would like to speak on this item, Mr. Richard Ray. You okay? All right, in favor, it's not really an action item, but uh, you like the budget. Uh, all right, appreciate it. Other council members, council members, CCO, please. Just one on the maximizing the property tax rate. So when you're maximizing the primary, doesn't the secondary become a problem at that point, enough to cover debt? And doesn't the secondary then need to go up? Uh, not necessarily. Um, if you remember, we've got the early redemption fund. So what, what we're doing now, Denise is managing the early redemption fund, and we're managing that coupled with the secondary collections. So we're bringing down that second, that early redemption fund and using the collections on the secondary. Those two things together are what are helping us keep that rate constant right well, now. Well, the redemption fund is artificial in its own. It was just due to an over collection early on, correct? It's due to excess property value growth. Right, and it's an over collection at that point. So the question I've got then is that the policy of maximizing the primary when the redemption fund is gone and we're continually maximizing the primary, won't that cause the secondary to go up to pay uh, the debt? It, it depends, it could, um, but again, it also depends on when the debt expires on the secondary side. So as Denise has the very detailed secondary and geo bond schedule, you can start to see the principal payments going away and the interest going away. So we will at some point be shifting back from primary to secondary. So what I'd like to see, Mayor, if it's at all possible, because I mean, there's always two sides of this thing here too, is to see when that, you know, that X crosses the line and when we expect the redemption fund to be down and we're gonna see an increase in property taxes at that point. I'd like to see that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Any other comments by members of the council on the five-year forecast? All right, thank you for the good news. We appreciate it very much. Net moving on to today's agenda will be item number three. Uh, item number three is, pr is proposed uh, changes to our City of Phoenix non-discrimination and anti-harassment uh, policy, in particular, the possible adoption of a anti-sexual harassment policy as it relates to elected officials in the City of Phoenix. This item was uh, recommended by Councilwoman Kate uh, Gallego that it be researched by staff and then presented best practices uh, to the City Council. Council Gallego, any comments? Thank you. This is a very important issue nationally. The public has a lack of confidence generally in institutions' abilities to root out sexual harassment, but particularly in government. The City of Phoenix wants to lead in ethics and transparency, and so I really appreciate the fact that we took this up expeditiously. Thank you so much to our city manager's office, particularly Tony and Jenny for their great work on this, and our city attorney's office, particularly Dan Brown and Polly Rapp for the extensive research. This council really challenged our staff to look at best practices, not only across elected officials, but also across the business community, and they did that research and come up with best practices. So I really appreciate everyone 
taking this so seriously. Um, worked particularly with Councilman Jim Waring, although in a public setting because we are on a three-person subcommittee, so we cannot work in a... <laughs> um, we wanted to follow and be, develop this policy in an ethical way. And so do, do, doing forward in, in a public setting. Um, but this is something that we first discussed at a policy session in December, and it is already moving forward in February. So I think that shows how seriously the city took this. Um, there'll still be some steps to go forward, but I really appreciate everyone saying that there is no place for harassment and that the city of Phoenix wants to lead in this area. And in fact, we are leading nationally and have just heard from Councilman Greg Landsman from the city of Cincinnati who wants to take what we're doing and, and bring it to Cincinnati. And I don't know if our assistant city manager put in a good word for us. I hear he is well connected uh, in that particular area, but we can continue to give back to, to Cincinnati. So I want to thank everyone who's been very proactive in addressing this important issue. Um, in particular, the Phoenix Women's Commission really supported this and said it needed to happen. And um, the Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence as well have been our partners in drafting this. So thank you to those groups as well for helping us make sure we do it right. Thank you very much. Councilman? Right, so, Mayor? Yeah, Councilman, you said you had something to say at the beginning before we get, get yeah, out of the I, item, please. I want to thank Councilman Waring and Councilwoman Gallego for putting this on the agenda. I mean, that you did exemplary work. Both of you did an amazing job on this, and you should be commended. Uh, this is something that should have happened years ago at the City of Phoenix, but the fact of the matter is you were able to work it through. You worked in a bipartisan way, and you were able to come up with something that works for the city, and it works for everybody. And I just want to give you both a, a great thanks for pushing this thing forward. All right, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Ms. Macaron then to uh, lead the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Stanton and council members. Good afternoon. In January, the council did ask staff to research best practices and also develop some options for uh, non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. Councilwoman Gallego is correct in the fact that we currently do have a sexual harassment policy for employees. However, there is not a policy currently for elected officials. With me today are Dan Brown and Paul with me today are Dan Brown and Polly Rapp from the Law Department, and they'll walk through our research findings and also talk about some options for the council to consider. Please. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, members of council, Dan Brown with the Law Department, and again, Polly Rapp. So uh, we're going to start today uh, with receiving some input and direction. And just as a quick reminder, our direction was to research best practices, procedures, and policies from large cities, Arizona cities, the private sector, and uh, what the applicable laws to City of Phoenix employees. So this is what we found. Large cities generally include a, an anti-harassment policy within a non-discrimination policy. Almost all of the jurisdictions uh, that we researched did so. And half of those included the non-discrimination policy and an ethics policy. What we also learned is essentially it broke down into thirds. A third of the council itself investigated complaints. The other third investigated complaints through a commission similar to the proposed ethics commission. And then the, the last third uh, investigated complaints through a special prosecutor. As far as sanctions, uh, almost all of them had sanctions or included sanctions for censure. Some had fines and then others almost all included the possibility of removal. We looked into the uh, state legislature. What we learned is that the state senate, believe it or not, is one of the few jurisdictions that solely included an anti-harassment policy. They don't have it within the context of a non-discrimination policy. The house does. Both houses investigated through a third party investigator or a review panel and both houses include sanctions for wit written reprimand termination and revocation of privileges as far as the private sector uh, we looked at APS Intel Google Apple again uh, those four public sector organizations included an anti-harassment policy within the context of a non-discrimination policy and uh, Actually, APS included it within the ethics policy, all four uh, reported violations to their human resources department. So 
from a best practices, if this uh, council wishes to follow best practices of large cities, other Arizona cities, the private sector, and to follow the policy that applies to City of Phoenix employees, the policy would read as follows. The City of Phoenix elected officials, board members, volunteers must not, by words or conduct, harass or discriminate against any person based on the person's race, color, religion, sex, national origin, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, marital status, gender, gender identity, or expression, or disability. And that also includes that elected officials, board members, and volunteers must not retaliate against any person who makes a complaint of discrimination or participates in the investigation. With that, so that concludes our research. And so uh, out of that research, we uncovered several decision points for this council to consider. Number one, what is the body or who is to investigate complaints? The options are the ethics uh, commission or a similar commission, the council itself or a subcommittee, or an independent investigator special prosecutor. And as part of our research, what we learned is it's important to keep the victims and the respondents' identities confidential and also to prevent chilling. Uh, we learned that any sort of discrimination or harassment claims should not be subject to frivolous complaint sanctions. As far as sanctions against elected officials, Again, the options are censure, civil fines, the, the council may enact those now. But as far as removal, that would require a charter amendment. There are two models for removal that we uh, uncovered. One is what we call the uh, MESA model, which is a direct vote by the council itself. And that would generally, like in MESA, it requires a supermajority. The other model is uh, the San Diego model where they uh, refer the removal to the voters by special election. Uh, the sanctions against board members all include existing uh, sanctions such as censures, civil fines, removal from office. The other decision point for this council to consider today is where should this policy reside? It could reside within the ethics ordinance or it could be a standalone separate ordinance within the city code. There's also decision points regarding the effective date. If the council were to approve a an ordinance today, it would automatically go into effect 30 days if, if the council didn't designate a specific time. The other issues and decision points are the prior conduct that's involved. One option is a one year uh, prior. That would be consistent with the EEOC investigation where they generally will look back 300 days. That it would not, the other options is simply not to make it retroactive make it applicable to all future conduct. And then uh, the other option is to make it apply to conduct for the term of office. There's also de deadlines to file claims. State law requires one year. There's other limits. And then finally, no limit at all. The other big issue that we looked at too and is a decision point that this council must consider is the, the type of conduct to which the policy applies. One option is all conduct, whether it's within the office or not. The second option would be solely applicable to course and scope within city responsibilities. And then option C is a, a, essentially a, a combination. In other words, the non-discrimination anti-harassment policy would apply only to uh, conduct within the course and scope of city responsibilities. And then there's a proposal to add language of comply with all laws in the ethics policy to address other conduct outside of non-discrimination, anti-harassment uh, during uh, other periods outside course and scope of responsibility. So at this point, we're here to receive city input and direction. Um, we did present this uh, item to the Shan subcommittee last week. And uh, I'll quickly uh, highlight their recommendation to this council as far as investigations. They recommended an independent investigator. As far as sanctions, they recommended all of those for elected officials and referred an amendment 
uh, to the charter to the voters for consideration, and that would be removal from office following the Mesa model. The, for board members, they recommended removal from office. As far as policy options, they recommended a separate policy adopted by this council. As far as effective date, they recommended 30 days from adoption and the conduct would apply to the conduct within the term of office and that there would be no limit to claim deadlines. And finally, let me go back here. Uh, as far as application, they're recommending option C, which was the non-discrimination anti-harassment would apply to course and scope within city responsibilities, but the ethics ordinance would also be amended to add comply with all laws. So that's where we are to date. And with that, I'm open to take any questions. All right, well, uh, I see right now if uh, Councilman Gallego has a motion to make, we'll put it on the floor, see if there's a second, and then we'll, there's a couple of uh, uh, folks from the audience that would like to make comments as well, and then we'll turn it over to the council for uh, questions for our, uh, our team that's uh, in front of us. Councilman Gallego, do you have a motion? Move approval of the draft ordinance as approved by the Sustainability Housing Efficiency and Neighborhood Subcommittee. Second. There is a motion, there is a second. Uh, two speakers would like to uh, present before this council. Ms. Jody Liggett, would you come to uh, provide testimony, followed by Ms. Jesse Johnson. Mayor, Great just a point of clarification. So you can take an action on a policy recommendation. We also do have the city clerk here, and it's posted for you to adopt it as an ordinance today, if you would like to do that. As yes, well. we'll have to, after we hear from uh, the public, uh, the city clerk will read the 24-hour paragraph to make sure we are A-OK. -okay. Thank you for that polite reminder. Good afternoon, my name is Jody Leggett. I am the chair of the Phoenix Women's Commission. Um, we are very proud to be here today and support you in your efforts. This city has taken on tough issues affecting vulnerable people like domestic violence, homelessness, sex trafficking, uh, equal pay, and now sexual harassment by elected officials. I'll keep my comments brief um, because really, Despite all your options, what we're talking about today is very simple, that the rights of a victim should not vary um, on the basis of who the perpetrator is. That's really what this all comes down to. I wanna thank Councilwoman Gallego for her tireless work on this and many other issues. Um, we were so proud to support the Equal Pay Ordinance um, in combination with you and the rest of the, the council and mayor. Um, we also want to support this policy, um, which is long overdue. Um, in fact, it's a little terrifying that we hadn't addressed this specifically, and we're so glad that you're able to do that, hopefully, um, today. I've had a long career. I've worked in many levels of government. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that harassment can occur in any of those settings. Um, and that's certainly not something that we would want to see, and we certainly wouldn't want perpetrators to um, go unpunished. Victims' rights, again, should not vary on who the perpetrator is. Um, we would also like to thank um, Councilman Waring and Councilwoman Stark for their work on this in subcommittee. And I think I'll turn it over to my companion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Liggett. Ms. Johnson. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Jesse Johnson. I'm representing the Arizona Coalition and Sexual and Domestic Violence. So thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, and thank you again, Councilwoman Gallego, for leading the charge on this policy um, and bringing it forward to City Council. Um, unfortunately, the issue of sexual harassment and abuse often, often is not talked about until something happens. And so we're happy to support the proactivity of um, Councilwoman Gallego and the City Council in adopting this policy. And um, unveiling the shadows of the issue of sexual harassment and abuse. Um, the draft, poly, draft policy reaffirms the city's commitment to stand against sexual harassment and provide sufficient investigation and sanction mechanisms to ensure violators um, are held accountable and that victims have the appropriate protections in place to report. Um, Again, we appreciate the policy adoption, commend the council and Councilwoman Gallego for leadership and bringing it forward, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, testimony. Now if we could read the 24-hour paragraph. The title of the ordinance number G6422 on the agenda was available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore made by, may be read by title or agenda item only. 
Ordinance G6422, an ordinance amending Phoenix City Code, Chapter 2, Article 2, Section 2-52B, to add compliance with all applicable laws to the ethics policy and establishing a non-discrimination and anti-harassment policy by adding new Phoenix City Code, Section Chapter 2, Article 2, Section 2-54, and referring an amendment to Phoenix City Charter, Chapter 17, the recall, to permit removal of an elected official from office for a violation of the City of Phoenix ethics, gift, conflict of interest, or non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies. All right, thank you very much. So we have a motion, we have a second. I'll turn to the members of the council for questions and or comments. Councilwoman Stark, please. Mayor, I just wanted to thank Councilwoman Gallego and Councilman Waring for bringing this to um, the council at large. It was good work and I really appreciate all the work you did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Other members of the council? Councilman Waring, please. So the original plan, as uh, Kate alluded to, was for us to work together because of a, uh, is this a phrase? The appropriate awkwardness of the um, open meeting laws, so we'll phrase it that way. Um, we couldn't, as it turns out, a, a, a droid staffer in my office was like, you guys can't meet because you only got three people on your subcommittee. Now, there hadn't been a three-person subcommittee in the city in a long time for this very reason. Uh, same reason they expanded, I think, the number of corporation commissioners. You couldn't even get an elevator together without somebody alleging malfeasance. So, However, we did take um, sort of a two-track thing. Mostly, though, this is, uh, Councilman DeCicio's comments were extremely nice, but also unfounded. You know, this is, this is Kate's thing, and I appreciate very much her work on it. Um, it, is, uh, it is needed. But um, we kind of wound up in the, the same place. I think we saw, I think we added one word in subcommittee or something. The, the menu that you see up there, I selected the same things that turned out she selected, uh, just unknowingly. So. Uh, so that was uh, probably a promising sign that maybe we're on the right track. Uh, and, uh, and I think Deb was there, so she probably got a kick out of that. We sort of great minds think alike, I guess. Um, the list of, of items is not every one that other uh, entities use, but I believe it is the same items that apply to the city staff as a whole, correct? I do think it, that's correct. I mean, you guys are nodding. I can see you, but the audience can't. So. Answer is yes. I, I do think that's appropriate uh, to have a different standard, more or less, for us. Wouldn't, wouldn't really make sense in that context. So we're getting treated, I guess a question for staff, pretty much exactly the same as the 14,000 city employees. Is that a fair statement? Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, yes, that's a fair statement. Yeah, and I, I think that is appropriate. So we went up in the right place and uh, thank Kate for her efforts in allowing me to to include my one word and uh, appreciate very much. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Other members of the, uh, of the, of the council? Councilman Valenzuela, please. I also wanna thank uh, Councilman Gallego. I think there's, this, is, uh, this is strong leadership and, and I agree. We, we have some real champions that spoke up on this. I mean, it's 2018, it's, it's pretty amazing we didn't have something like this in place so, uh, so this is good for, for our city and uh, I, I appreciate the one word that, that uh, Councilman Waring added, but I also appreciate the fact that he, he shifted the spotlight where it belongs. This is Kate's thing and I wanna uh, thank and congratulate my, my colleague on the council. Uh, this, is, this is good for the city, it's good for public trust and uh, it, it continues to move us, uh, move us forward. All right, any other comments or questions by the council? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, motion passes unanimously. Congratulations all for your great work. There being no further business before the city council on today's policy session, we are adjourned.